Before getting on to my other talks, I've been asked to give a bit more detail about why I think the Soviet Union collapsed. So what I'm going to be talking about here are immediate causes. I'm not talking about the long-term structure of the Soviet economy and the social relations involved. That is a subject of other talks, which on the web have already appeared, but will, in the day school, be given after uh, this one. One of the things you have to take into account is the sheer scale of the Soviet collapse. It was a, an economic disaster that's otherwise been unprecedented in pre peacetime. There have been collapses in economic production during war. There have been recessions. But what happened was that the world's second superpower was reduced to the status of a minor bankrupt economy with a huge decline in industrial production and also a huge decline in living standards as measured by the most fundamental measure, at all, measure of all, which is the number of people dying. Here we see on the bottom line the Soviet death rate de declines rapidly from 1939 to the early 60s, then rises somewhat. Now, why did it rise? Proximate causes often given are a rise in the level of alcoholism and the rise in the level of occupationally caused diseases. Another factor was that in 1960, um, it's possible that the death rate was artificially lower than it would otherwise have been due to the killing off of a substantial fraction of the population that would have been reaching um, the age which they normally die of uh, diseases of old age because these people had been killed off during the war. But the, what really is striking is how, after the restoration of capitalism, the the death rate goes up by 50% almost, say, from 10 per thousand to around 15 per thousand. At the same time, the birth rate collapses. So, whilst you had a growing population, you shifted to a shrinking population. If you solely take into account the death rate, the rise in the death rate, there were 5.7 million excess deaths in the first 10 years of capitalism in the Soviet Union. And that is a dreadful figure. There's something like that beginning to happen in the United States, where the death rate has risen, or it's risen among working class male, white males. And in Britain, under the Tory government that's currently in power, the death rate is rising. Um, but nothing like the scale which occurred in the Soviet Union. So what were the long-term causes of this? Well, from 1930 to 1970, the Soviet Union grew very well. It went from being level with Brazil towards being the second industrial and technological and military power in the world by the mid-1960s. I give Brazil as an example because people during the Cold War tended to compare the USA with the USSR, which is totally unrealistic. Because in 1917, Russia was way behind the USA in economic development. You have to compare it with countries which were on the same level. Now, comparing it with India would be taking a country that was perhaps a little too backward. But comparing it with Brazil or Bolivia is more realistic. Then there was a subsequent slowdown after the 1970s or from the late 70s. It's easy for an economy to grow rapidly during the initial phase of industrialization when labor is being switched from agriculture to industry. Afterwards, growth in productivity slows down 
because improvements in productivity in an already industrialized economy are harder to achieve than the difference in productivity between a manual and horse-powered agriculture, which is what Russia, Russian economy was predominantly in 1917, to a fossil fuel-powered and nuclear-powered industrial economy. There's a huge difference in productivity there. But increasing the productivity within the industrial economy is inherently harder. We also have to take into account that a relatively large part of the Soviet industrial output was devoted to defence, particularly during the latter stages of the Cold War, when they're in competition with Reagan's Stark Wars programme. And if uh, you've got skilled engineers working on this, they're clearly not working on developing new products and developing new techniques of production. Then there was the embargo imposed by the Western countries on new technology or advanced technological equipment. This meant that the USSR and the Comic-Con group had to rely heavily on internally developed techniques and technologies, whereas the whole of the capitalist world could share technologies. There were no obstacles to the ship of advanced technology to Japan or to Britain or France. So that, taken as a whole, the capitalist world had a larger population of scientists, engineers, developing new techniques and would tend to develop faster. Beyond that, though, there was a waste of labour in the Soviet Union. It certainly didn't use labour as efficiently as in the USA or West Germany, for example. Now, in one sense, the USSR used labour very effectively. It didn't have any unemployment, and the proportion of women in full-time employment was very high. But for a developed industrial economy to move with the times, it has to be able to transfer labour to where it can be most efficiently used. A capitalist economy does this by maintaining a, a pool of unemployed, and that's inefficient at a macro level because it, the unemployed are not producing anything. But it does mean that new start-up enterprises can be established relatively easily, drawing on this pool. But I think there's something beyond that, because all that had happened is that Soviet industrial growth had slowed down to US levels. The US had experienced relatively slow growths, 2.5% a year, for decades without a crisis. And indeed, if you look at the figures for working class living standards, in the USA they stagnated from the time of Nixon onwards, whereas in the USSR, between the time of Nixon and the time of Gorbachev, they were still rising. The difference was in the position of the intelligentsia and managerial strata. In the USA, since the 1970s, nearly all the rise in national income has gone to the top 10% of the population. Whereas in the USSR, income differentials were much narrower, and therefore this slower rate of growth of overall national income meant a slower rate of growth of the intelligentsia, which to them seemed intolerable stagnation, both compared to the rapid improvement in living standards they'd seen during the 50s and 60s, and also compared to the rising living standards that the equivalent strata that they identified with were achieving in the USA or in Germany. Now, that wouldn't matter by itself were it not for the fact that managerial strata, technically educated strata, were disproportionately influential within the USSR. The USSR was notionally a w run by the Communist Party, which was notionally a workers' party. But being a worker included technical and managerial staff. They were treated as workers. And a high proportion of the its members were drawn from the most skilled technical and professional employees. Party membership was highest in this area. So manual workers were proportionally underrepresented. This meant that the upper part, well, the membership of the party had a disproportionate bias 
towards those who thought they would do better in a, 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 a Western type economy. And that was right, of course. If you look at the figures for the death rate in the Soviet, in the ex-Soviet Union, death rate zoomed among former collective farmers and among factory workers. But among people with a university degree, the death rate did not rise. So they were shielded from the disastrous effects of the dismantling of the Soviet Union. In the medium term, though, the causes were the policies that Gorbachev's government embarked on in its attempt to improve the, the economy. The combined effect of these policies was to bankrupt the state and debauch the currency. In order to see how that happened, you have to realise that the financial basis of the Soviet state lay in the taxes that it levied on turnover by enterprises and on sales taxes, such as the sales tax on alcohol. So what did Gorbachev do? In order to improve work discipline, one of the first things he did was to ban alcohol. Now, Russia certainly had a chronic problem of over-drinking. And the ban on alcohol did improve or reduce absenteeism and improved work discipline and produce short-term games in production. But at the same time, a black market arose. And on the basis of this black market, criminal gangs became rich selling bootleg alcohol. And money which previously had gone to the state in the form of alcohol taxes was now going to these gangsters. And because the the state no longer had the revenue from the, the vodka sales and the wine sales and the beer sales, and they didn't raise any other taxes to compensate, it caused a budget deficit, which contributed to a, an inflationary process. This was made far worse by Gorbachev following the advice of reformers who said, oh, initiative by enterprises is being held back by the fact they have to pay so much in taxes to the central government. So Gorbachev eased off on the amount of turnover tax they had to pay. Did they use it more efficiently? No. What happened was you got a catastrophic revenue crisis for the state. The state had to then rely on credit from the central bank to cover its expenditure. The money stock shot up. You got rapid inflation. Goods disappeared from the shops because of the inflation. And you got an erosion of public confidence in the socialist economy as a whole. Now that created a morale crisis and an economic crisis across the whole union. Fermented nationalism in, in the marginal states. And because of the concessions Gorbachev was making to, to nationalist movements, there was a coup d'etat by elements of the army to try and displace him and restore a unified um, state structure to the USSR. But these people lacked the determination to carry out their coup, and it shortly collapsed after a few days. Now, after the coup collapsed, Gorbachev should have come back and been re-established as president of the USSR. But what happened was that Yeltsin then carried out a coup, displaced Gorbachev as a ruler, and dissolved the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. When the elected Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation then started opposing the measures of privatization that Yeltsin was carrying out, Yeltsin carried out a second coup, calling in the military himself to shell the, the parliament into submission, and then created a system of presidential, centralized presidential government. And on the 
instructions of U.S. advisers, he introduced a shock program that was designed to convert the economy from socialism to capitalism in a hundred days. According to neoliberal theory, once the enterprises were free from the state, the magic of the market would ensure that they would spontaneously interact productively and efficiently for the public good. But this is based on a quite unrealistic idea of how markets work. Even in market economies, or so-called market economies, markets of the sort described in economic textbooks are limited to specialist areas like the world oil and currency markets. The main industrial structure of the economy doesn't depend on this sort of market. Instead, it depends on an interlinked system of regular producer-consumer relationships in which the same suppliers make regular weekly deliveries to the same customer week in, week out. These are, are pre-arranged and regular relationships. In the USSR, this interlinked system stretched right across Europe and Asia. Enterprises depended on regular state orders. You had towns and communities in the wilds of Siberia that survived only due to the fact that there were regular state orders which they met and they got income from that. When the state was too bankrupt to continue making these orders, once it could no longer afford to pay wages, and when the planning network was was dismantled, what occurred was not spontaneous self-organisation, which is what liberal theory said would happen, but instead a domino process of collapse. Without any orders, factories engaged in primary industries closed down. Without the supplies of components to secondary industries, the secondary industries could no longer continue production, so they closed down. So you got a rapid and destructive cascade. Industry after industry closed down. Here is some idea of the scale of it. This is 13 years after, so it allows some time for a recovery. But 13 years after 1990, our total output was only 66% of what it should have been. Um, oil survived well because the economy shifted to being an oil exporter rather than an industrial economy. You can see that light industry had fallen to 15% of its previous level machine building to 54%. Even food production fell to 67% as the economy de became more and more dependent on food imports. If we compare what had been happening in the Brezhnev period in what was described as intolerable stagnation, if we project forward the 2.5% growth achieved at the end of the Brezhnev period, which was really poor by Soviet standards, output would have been 140% of the 1990 level 13 years later. The net effect was to leave Russia with less than half the industrial capacity that it could have expected from even the poorest performing years of the socialist economy. What are the key lessons of this? One thing is that it's vital that the state maintain a strong, honest and efficient system of tax revenues. This gets far too little attention from leftists. When attempting to manage rapidly changing social relations, it's important not to dismantle old economic mechanisms faster than new ones can be put into place. So any socialist government coming to power has to bear that in mind when moving in the opposite direction. Another thing is we should never overestimate the ability of markets to organise an economy. They're not that good at it. Obviously, you've got to be aware the risk that a corrupt managerial structure will attempt to divert state property into a private domain. Well, that's something that's been happening during the process of privatisation and has to be reversed now. You can also see the fatal effects of allowing the existence of criminal black markets, initially for alcohol. But this gave rise to a gangster class who became dominant under Yeltsin. 
And until you can actually phase out money by introducing a system of labour accounts, which can't be done until you've nationalised the whole economy, it's very dangerous to allow rapid inflation to take hold. That is a mistake that, for example, the Venezuelans have also made. 